Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this issue of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine, the official ASEP CME publication. With you is Danya Koja. And this is Wendy Chang. And we will be talking about the October 2019 issue. As you guys are probably familiar by now, the Critical Decisions publication has usually two lessons. They cover the bread and butter of emergency medicine, or sometimes topics that are a little more cutting edge. There are also features like the critical EKG, critical image, and then as all of our listeners know, my favorite, the LLSA review. So for the first lesson, it's called a breakdown, talking about rhabdomyolysis. So thank you, Dr. Juan Marcos Rondon and Amanda Elizabeth Offer. So when I think about rhabdomyolysis, I usually think about crush injuries or people who fell and couldn't get up and they've been, you know, down for a prolonged period of time. Apparently, there are also medications that can cause rhabdomyolysis. Well, why is this topic worth talking about? So we totally think about it with the things that you're saying, you know, old Lee fell and couldn't get up. But there's a lot of other causes. And the problem is that it can be deadly, especially when it's missed early on. And that happens more often than it should. So I know that rhabdo is essentially breakdown of muscle cells. Why does this happen? So the obvious cause could be something like trauma, so a crush injury. So if you crush the muscle cell, it breaks down. So that's easy. And then the other one would be disruption in the cell metabolism. So because of medications or connective tissue disease or something like that, the cell metabolism itself gets disrupted, and that causes the muscle cell itself to break down. And table one in the article has a thorough list of the causes and examples. And that's really helpful to take a look at because there's quite a few scenarios out there that we don't think of rhabdo in as, you know, quickly as we do with the other ones. Now, the problem is that when you have an injury to the cell itself, then there is swelling. If there is swelling, the cell dies. And when it dies, it releases myoglobin, potassium, phosphate, and calcium into your bloodstream. And that overwhelms the clearing mechanisms of the body and accumulates in the body. And that is why you have all of the badness from the myoglobin concentrating in your kidneys. You have the potassium and the calcium in all of these. And that's the problem. Wow. Okay. I normally think about just the muscle breakdown and then the potassium, but certainly a lot more than that. Anything else that we have to remember about the pathophys? So we need to remember that it's not just these things happening, but then they cause complications. Like I alluded to briefly when the myoglobin accumulates in the kidneys, that causes renal failure. When you have potassium accumulating, then it causes arrhythmias and so on. So there's a really great figure in this article, figure two, that has the summary of these complications, but also their treatment. So definitely, potassium is a major component of rhabdo that I often think about especially, like you mentioned, for arrhythmias, cardiac complications. Yep, and so is hypocalcemia, which is actually the earliest electrolyte abnormality. I did not know that. Oh, me neither. However, the most deadly complications of all is DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Definitely something to be scared about. Very scared of. Yeah, very scared of, I agree. (laughs) Again, another complication I don't normally think about. Okay. So when should we suspect rhabdo? So the classic triad is posterior muscle pain, so like the thighs, the buttocks, and so on, muscle weakness, and dark or decreased urine. And as you know, Wendy, classic means not common. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, 15% or so. So interestingly, 50%, 5-0, half of the people who have rhabdomyolysis will not have any muscle-related complaints, which is kind of scary, and that's why we definitely need to keep a high index of suspicion in patients with risk factors. Wow, okay. So anybody who comes in that doesn't look right, I'm going to start thinking about rhabdo. Well, right, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> so how do we diagnose it then? So the way we usually diagnose it is when the CK or the creatinine kinase is three to five times or more the upper limit of your normal value. That's something to keep in mind. However, so a little bit of an elevation, so if your upper limit of normal is 200 and they're coming in with a 300, that's not rhabdo, which really irritates me because some people still say that and do that. And I'm like, no, it is not rhabdo. However, it's important to keep in mind that the CK can take up to 12 hours to rise and the peak happens at like 48 to 72 hours later 
So if a person comes in and you really suspect rhabdo and you do a CK level and it's normal or mildly elevated, you should not exclude it if you are concerned because it needs to be repeated when you have high clinical suspicion because it's going to take up to 12 hours to start rising. Okay. Other things that you need to take a look at are, of course, like an EKG for arrhythmias, as you mentioned, a UA to look for the myoglobin in that dark urine, check their liver, look at their calcium, and check their blood gas for acidosis. All right. So I know that to treat rhabdo, we give them lots of fluids to flush the kidneys. Anything else? Yes, fluids, more fluids. So the ballpark is like to start giving them like a couple of liters, especially if they're young and healthy otherwise. But the real goal is not how much fluid we give them. The real goal is to give them a urine output of 200 to 300 ml per hour. So as you said, to make sure you're flushing those kidneys, not just flooding them and covering them with fluids, but that that fluid is going through and they're excreting it as urine. Some people add bicarbonate as well. So they do like three amps and a liter of D5 water and run it at 100 ml per hour, especially in patients who have a low pH of 7.1, because that can help the body clear the myoglobin. Of course, if the patient has hyperkalemia, then you need to treat them for the hyperkalemia and give them medications to lower the potassium and stabilize their myocardium, so calcium gluconate and so on. And of course, if all else fails, they're still acidotic and hyperkalemic, then dialysis. The article has a great algorithm in figure three that kind of helps you go through like a stepwise approach of how to do this and when to, you know, stop giving fluids, move on to dialysis and so on. Yeah, cool. I really like the figure for sure, because I don't think that I often think about the patient's volume status in mm -hmm. rhabdo. And so definitely that's also a key point. All right. I think we get a little spoiled because the majority of patients that we tend to see in our practice who come in with rhabdo are young, healthy, and underwent a trauma or drug intoxication or so on. So we have a lot of wiggle room with the fluids, as you mentioned. But it gets tricky with a little old lady who fell and now has rhabdo, and she has an EF of like 10. <laughs> exactly. Agreed. So I'm assuming, obviously, the very severe cases we will admit, but do we have to admit everybody? Nope. Almost everybody. Your rare case where you're boarding them in the ED for 24 hours, you know what? You might as well just discharge them. <laughs> However, <laughs> if you have that magical ED that does not have wait times and does not have any patients boarding, then yes, everyone gets admitted. The real question is who needs to go to the intensive care unit versus who can go to the floor rather than who can get discharged. Okay. All right. This was a great summary. I, I learned a lot from this article. So I learned that there's more than just trauma, crush injuries that cause rhabdo, and the complications from it is more than just kidney failure and hyper, hyper I was about to say hyper potassium. It's okay. You can call it hyperpotassemia. <laughs> Some people out there are smiling at your hyperpotassemia. <laughs> yes. And hyperkalemia. And especially with the, the hypocalcemia that can happen, a lot of our treatment is going to be focus towards stabilizing the myocardium. And I think that the refresher on the criteria for rhabdo is really three to five times or more the upper limit of normal and lots of fluids as long as they can tolerate it. And for our critical EKG this month, it's actually an EKG of a paced rhythm, which often becomes tricky in deciding whether or not somebody has ischemic changes. It's a great reminder what normal discordance between the QRS complex and the SD segment should look like. If that is lost or exaggerated, then you have to be worried about ischemia. That's a great reminder. Paced rhythms kind of make me like a little uncomfortable, actually a lot uncomfortable, but maybe that's just me. So moving on to our critical cases in orthopedics and trauma, this month we're talking about knee dislocation, and the photo is really impressive. Ugh, it's, I, I don't think you need an x-ray to actually confirm that that knee is dislocated. It's kind of obvious to everyone, but you definitely do need to get an x-ray to make sure it's not also broken and dislocated. So in cases of knee dislocation, you need to reduce it as soon as possible because you have a lot of concerns about the blood supply. And as soon as it's reduced, place it in a long splint and keep it at a 20 degree flexion of the knee. 
So definitely a reminder also to take these injuries really seriously, even if they have been reduced pre-hospital spontaneously. So the patient comes in and describes it sounds like a knee dislocation, but it reduced, don't jump to the conclusion that it's just a patellar problem. Because if it is a knee dislocation, then the risk of vascular injury is 30%. So one out of every three people that are going to have a knee dislocation will have a vascular injury, which is most commonly the popliteal artery injury. And if you have pedal pulses, then that is not 100% sensitive for the fact that you have no vascular injury. You have an absent pedal pulse in only 80% of a clinically significant vascular injury. So you have 20% of them who have pulses and still have vascular injury. The article has a great treatment algorithm to remind you of who needs what and how to address the possibility of vascular injury. So definitely a great reminder of a high risk injury. Yes, definitely. So speaking of dislocations, the critical procedure is a closed reduction of posterior elbow dislocation. And I remember the first one I did, it was right after I graduated residency, because of course, why would I do one when I had like, you know, 27 bajillion attendings? I was by myself and I was working at a community hospital. So it's like, okay, I don't know what to do with that. I called the ortho on call. Thankfully, it was the afternoon. And he was like, just put it back. Why are you calling me? And I'm like, oh, okay. So any tips, Wendy? Just pull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got the gist of that. I was pulling <laughs> yeah. a lot. Right. This section actually has a great diagram because there's actually two approaches you can take in reducing a posterior elbow dislocation. The prone approach is preferred as the first attempt, and literally you place the patient prone on the stretcher, and that will allow you essentially, you know, not have the second person to provide counter traction. And the main movements you're trying to do is abduction, abduction of the arm, and then you'll hold on to the patient's hand and supinate the forearm while you're trying to do the traction while pushing the olecranon down. So I think that's one of the advantages of the prone technique. And then, of course, afterwards, if you hear the clunk of it having been successfully reduced, do some gentle range of motion to confirm that it is definitely in place. The other approach is obviously having two people, and you're essentially having the second person act like what the stretcher was doing for you when you had the patient prone, and that person will provide the counter traction while the person who's doing the reduction is essentially doing the same motions of abduction, grabbing the hand, wrist, and supination with the traction and push, push, or pull in the other direction. (laughs) Afterwards, you need to remember to splint the patient's um, arm in a posterior splint at more than 90 degrees flexion. And then, of course, uh, follow up with ortho. Got it. Now, obviously, as with all the dislocations that we talk about, if they're complex, then they have a fracture in them. If they have a neurovascular compromise, if they're open, then they need to go to the OR. With elbows, and this is actually what ended up happening to this patient, is that she had persistent instability. So her elbow kept popping back out. And the concern was that she had a lot of ligamentous injury. So she ended up actually going to the OR a couple of days later. Okay, for my favorite section, the LLSA review, this month is actually about thrombolytics for acute PE. I think it's always a great reminder on differentiating massive versus submassive PE, one, because our treatments may differ and also it helps you communicate with your consultants. So as a reminder, massive PEs are patients who present really hemodynamically unstable, maybe also with pulselessness in arrest, whereas submassive PE are patients who have near normal blood pressures, but they do have evidence of right heart strain, elevations of the BNP, uh, newly elevated troponin, et cetera. In terms of thrombolytics, I think most of us would agree that the evidence is clear for pulseless patients or patients with massive PEs, but it's less clear in submassive PEs. Really, some of the research suggests that thrombolytics in submassive PEs may reduce pulmonary hypertension. And of course, that you know, would improve the patient's outcome from that standpoint. But of course, it's with, with something as scary as thrombolytics, we have to balance it with the risk of bleeding. Potentially, if you have access to some of the subspecialists, or maybe you can consider things like catheter-directed thrombolysis or mechanical embolectomy, or also half-dose thrombolytics in patients that have high risk of bleeding, like the elderly, or in patients who have failed systemic thrombolysis. Got it. So the conclusion of this LSA review is we still have no idea. Correct. (laughs) Got it. Okay. All right. 
So now I feel updated on the lack of literature for thrombolytics for submassive P. Moving on to the critical image. It's a case of pain at a site of a remote baloney amputation. And there are several images of the x-rays and so on. And it reviews the sensitivity and specificity of the findings of osteomyelitis on x-ray, CT, MRI, and interestingly, ultrasound. Because sometimes the ultrasound can give you a couple of clues that yes, you are starting to have an infection there. So definitely check it out. That's great. So for our second lesson, it's called Twist and Shout, Pediatric Scrotal Emergencies. Thank you for Drs. Thomas Cristoforo, Philip Sosa, and Lali Bahar Posey for writing this article. You know what, Wendy? I don't think you and I are unique in that Pete's conditions make us uncomfortable, especially talking about a genital complaint in a child that may or may not be able to provide a history. Correct. I agree. They might be shouting. <laughs> and twisting. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yes. So I like this article because it really helped us, you know, have a better approach to these genital complaints, scrotal emergencies. And the first question they suggest that we pose is to try and differentiate, is it mostly pain or is it mostly swelling that the patient is coming in with? Because if we're dealing with things like painless swelling, you're thinking of more benign pathologies like hydrocele, varicoceles, hernias, and potentially tumors. But if the patient is presenting mostly with pain, then you're really worried about torsion, epididymitis, or titus, things like that. And of course, timing is important. If the symptoms are developing over minutes to hours, that might pinpoint more towards torsion or torsion of the testicle or testicular appendage. If the patient has had pain that developed really greater than a 24-hour period, then maybe you're dealing with things more like epididymitis and orchitis. And then don't forget that it may not be actually of a scrotal etiology. It might be actually referred pain like appendicitis or renal colic. So try to figure out if the patient has any sort of GI or GU symptoms associated with this. That's a great reminder to do a more thorough exam of the rest of the belly and get a better history if you could. So let's start talking about the scariest of them all, the twisting, the testicular torsion. Interestingly, testicular torsion has a bimodal distribution. It's more common in neonates and then during puberty. And the classic symptoms are, you know, pain, high riding testicle, and absent cremasteric reflex. The key is that the pain may not be sustained. It actually can be intermittent because patients can have, you know, torsion and detorsion that's, you know, happening. And so don't be fooled by intermittent pain. And, and another interesting tidbit was apparently the left testicle is more commonly affected than the right. All right. So what if not the whole testicle is tender? Just part of it. The story really sounds very torsion-y, but not the whole testicle. Torsion can actually happen not just of the entire testicle. It can actually happen for the appendix testis or the epididymis. And so these patients may have more point tender pain, and they may even have a blue dot sign where that part of the appendage is actually gangrenous. And so that's another thought. But the workup is similar. Get a Doppler ultrasound. So how about infections? Let's talk about that. So infections, we normally think about epididymitis or also epididymoortitis. You're just trying to give me, you know, these long words that I'm trying to pronounce <laughs> <laughs> accurately. Uh, Multiple also, vowels, Y's and I's, because you know what, Y is sometimes a vowel. Ooh. That's true, <laughs> yes. So these can actually happen in a third of prepubertal boys with scrotal pain. And the classic finding is that if you elevate the scrotum, they can feel better. And apparently this is called prensine. I didn't even know that there was another, you know, name for this. There's a name um, for everything. That's true. Exactly. So they can come with or without GU symptoms like dysuria. And if you were to get a UA and culture, they, that may be negative. Of course, if you're dealing with sexually active patients, you have to think about STDs as the infective organism. And if we're dealing with kids, you know, kids nowadays are having sex at a much younger age. So got to consider that. Yeah, it's interesting at what age kids are starting to explore that. So, yes, just because you think they're too young does not mean that they think they're too young. So ask anything else. 
Yeah, so now we're dealing with things that are potentially more of the swelling presentation than the pain presentation. So things like varicoceles, which are dilated tortuous veins. These are uncommon in prepubertal boys. Their predominant symptoms are more maybe like swelling and heaviness. You should examine a patient standing up because obviously if this is, you know, kind of a varicose vein type of a situation of the scrotum. This is not an emergency, but the patients do need follow-up because it can affect fertility and actually may be a presenting sign of a retroperitoneal tumor. All right. How about painless swelling? There's no heaviness. There's just swelling. Yeah, so you might be dealing with hernias or hydroceles. And so hydroceles, if you remember, this is the swelling that you can transilluminate through the scrotum. These are not reducible. And so if you have pain that progresses or occurs, then you might have to worry about an incarcerated hernia. And then also you, when you're doing a GU exam, don't forget to check uh, the lymph nodes because there also may be presentation with a patient with cancer. All right. So with all these differentials that you're mentioning, does it mean that everyone needs an ultrasound so we can figure out what's going on in the ED? If they have severe pain, then yes. And don't forget, again, even if it's intermittent pain for those testicular torsion patients. Ultrasound sensitivity is much lower in intermittent torsion, about 75%, and also in small prepubertal testes. So how do we treat that? So if you're dealing with torsion, then you may have to consider doing manual detorsion in the ED while you're waiting for, of course, a immediate surgery from urology. And remember, the manual detorsion technique is that often described as opening the book type of motion. And, you know, it has been shown that doing manual detorsion in the ED actually improves testicular salvage because really you want the testicle to be detorsed within six hours. The rest, in terms of supportive care, you're talking about elevation, rest, pain control. And then if you're dealing with an infectious problem like epididymitis or orchitis, then you're talking about antibiotics. All right. So kind of summarizing what you just talked about, and you made this so much simpler. So thank you. Always ask, what's the most significant symptom? Is it the pain or the swelling? If there's pain, what's the timing of the pain? Because 24 hours and less, you definitely need to think of torsion. And always ask yourself, is the pain referred from somewhere else? And then on exam, make sure to, to check a chromosteric reflex and a pretin sign, which is the elevation. And if you can feel a mass that's not painful, then you need to transluminate it to see if it's a hydrocele or hernia. Dysuria and a positive UA are not necessary to diagnose an infection like epididymitis or architis. And ultrasound is not 100% sensitive, especially in intermittent torsion and very young patients. So if you have high clinical suspicion, you should not let that ultrasound rule everything out. And then everybody needs a follow-up, even for benign conditions like varicoceles, because they may be signifying something else that's happening, like a retroperitoneal tumor, or they could have a longer lasting effect on fertility. That's right. So our drug box this month is also another word I cannot pronounce. I'm guessing it's pronounced lethamulin but I don't really think so. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. If I don't know and you don't know, then we can just pretend it's correct. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm assured by the fact that since it's such a novel antibiotic, maybe that's why nobody knows how to pronounce it. So this is an antibiotic that we may start seeing more. It can be used to treat community-acquired bacterial pneumonias, but more interestingly, it can be used to treat multidrug-resistant Neisseria and mycoplasma infections. It can be given PO or IV, so that will be really useful for us in the ED. The key point with this medication is that it prolongs the QT, so you have to be really careful with that. And last but not least, for the talks box this month is a topic that is hot off the press, which is vaping-associated lung disease. And if you haven't heard of vaping-associated lung disease, then I don't know where you've been because there has been a ton of cases in the United States. The thought is that it's an acute interstitial lung disease with an element of like lipoid pneumonia. And patients present with like a dry cough, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, maybe a fever, but they're hypoxic. Their chest x-rays look gross. And sometimes you may need a CT to look for those ground glass opacities. Supportive care, oxygen, intubation, if they need it. And you can consider high dose IV steroids. 
I actually saw in the news today that the thought is that it actually may be a chemical burn that's causing this pneumonitis like picture because it's been unclear of what the underlying cause of all of this is. So that's one thought. You should consider notifying the local health department. However, things are changing so much that, for example, like the state of Maryland now requires notification. So definitely know what your state is requiring because these state requirements are changing. Yeah, definitely. Pretty severe cases for sure. Kind of scary. I'm sure we'll see more. Hopefully less, because apparently now a lot of places are refusing to sell vaping related things. That's so, good thing. yep, one move in the right direction. Well, thank you all for taking the time to listen to us this month. We hope that you enjoyed listening to us as much as we've enjoyed recording this. With you was Donnie Koja and Wendy Chang. And you can connect with us on Twitter on our Twitter accounts. So mine is at Tanya Koja. Mine is at EM underscore NCC. And hopefully we will see you this month at ASAP in Denver, Colorado. And if not, then until next month. Bye.